Welcome to the Everyone's a Critic Movie Review Podcast. I'm your co-host, Bob Zarrell. With me, as always, is professional film critic, Sean Patrick. Visit us at IHateCritics.net, Everyone's a Critic Podcast.com. We're at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Our handle is Critics Pod. Uh, subscribe to the show at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Alexa, all your podcasters. We're also on YouTube. We stream live either on Sunday mornings or Monday nights or even random times after that. But those are the main two. Uh, if you want to be notified, click on the little bell in the right-hand corner to get notified when we're streaming live. We're on Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash critics pods. The best way to help support the podcast. We're now doing bonus episodes monthly to try to encourage you to be a Patreon supporter. Even if it's for a, a couple bucks a month, it does help out. Uh, we just recorded a two hour, almost two hour, a 24 bonus podcast with, uh, the most likable member of the former member of the podcast, Josh, <laughs> joining us, uh, uh, and I know we talked a lot about a lot of those movies, but it's always fun to bring it back up. So uh, it, it was a lot of fun doing that episode. Uh, we, yeah. also, we also have the Ice Spit on Your Grave uh, episode out there as well. It's also on our normal feed, but uh, video only is on Patreon. So if you want to see the videos, they will be on Patreon. Uh, and then T Public, uh, our T Public page. Oh shit, that's not the right one. <laughs> Stop sharing. Share. <laughs> I swear to God, I hit the right one. Share. There we go. Oh, hey, look at that. Yeah, we got some. It's not even a model. I, they did this. I didn't. Uh, I'm sure it's fake. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you can get our logo. Uh, the Everyone's a critic and I hate critics uh, logo. The Lord of the Fitbit. Fellowship of the Steps. Batman versus Jesus. I'm wearing that now as well. Uh we also got Willem Dafoe's confusingly large wiener <laughs> and Cameron Diaz's shoulder. Uh, <laughs> all that is at our Patreon or uh, T Public. If you go to IHateCritics.net and click on the T Public link, uh, you can get any of the merch you want. You can also get these little notebooks that I'm using not to keep notes and show notes in. Uh, all sorts of stuff pillows, uh, tapestries, whatever you want. All right, let's get to the show. Uh, we'll start with probably going to win the Oscar, Nomadland. Very likely to win the Oscar, like a definite best picture contender. And, of course, it's it's Frances McDormand. You can't be su- too surprised about that. She's incredible. Uh, directed by Chloe Zhao, who did The Rider uh, back in 2017, which is another incredible movie. She's uh, the, the poet of the American, uh, modern American West. She's just, just, just beautiful. Uh, she she captures images and story so beautifully, and here she's telling the story of somebody who's on the on the very edge of society, a traveler, a, a nomad, if you will, uh, who is uh, she lost her husband and she now lives in this van, but not because she can't support herself necessarily, or that she doesn't uh, want to have a place to live. She just prefers living in this van that she's kitted out for herself to live in as a home. And it allows her to go different places and have different experiences and meet new people and, and just kind of take a tour through life in a way uh, that, that fits the way she sees the world and how, how unmoored she is from, from typical traditional life by what's taken place. The entire town in which she lived was completely devastated and no longer exists, which is a strange thing to think about, but it's it's happened uh, in recent American history where towns just stop existing. Uh, there was a, a very large company was there and then it wasn't. And when it was gone, the entire town was gone. And that uh, then her husband died and, and that's where she finds herself just kind of looking around the world. And that's the movie is just observing her and what she's doing and also creating these incredibly beautiful images along the way. Uh, it's it's a wonderful film, and Frances McDormand just delivers again and again with these brave and bold and beautiful performances. And, and unique performances. I mean, this is not like really anything typical uh, that you see from actors. It's just kind of, you know, she's not one of those actors you can typecast. Uh, she's, I mean, really, as much as Meryl Streep's great, she Frances McDormand could be the one that's nominated every year. I mean, that's how good she is in everything she does ever. Uh, it's and, and this is no exception. In fact, it may even be. 
I would say it's even better than the one she won just was the last year for, the year before, the three billboards. Oh, God, yeah. It she's, is better than three billboards. Oh, she's phenomenal. <laughs> I mean, and it's another slice of life movie where you're just kind of watching, a, you know, stuff happen. But because of the imagery, the direction, the acting, it really it, it's a, an easy watch, a good watch. And, I mean, you have to watch her kind of does she want to be here? Is she punishing herself? I mean, why? It, there's so much going on with why she's a nomad. And at the same time, there's times where you sit there and I mean, I could see some millennial or hipster being like, I could live like that. I want to start living my life, you know, living off right. the land, you know. But they have a good time when they get together and everybody's just kind of hanging out in their tr- vans and trailers. And I don't know. I, this was a really <laughs> enjoyable movie. It's, there's no uh, Alex Jones conspiracy theories, no no tinfoil hats. Of, you know, we're, live, we're trying to live off the grid, get away from the government, or any type of nonsense like that. No. Uh, the, and uh, the, the spirit that they cultivate when they do get together, these this group of people who all live in vans or you know of similar uh, transportation, uh, they they get together and they just support each other and they give each other things like, oh, I need one of those. Well, I have one here. You can have it. I've already got two. Uh, and that's just basically it's it's almost like uh, a perfect socialist utopia when they get together, which is kind of sweet and, and beautiful in its way. Uh, in, in a weird way, uh, this is kind of a, a spiritual sequel to another movie that that I just watched and, and, t- and talked about a lot this week called the uh, Ruby in Paradise, uh, where this could be Ashley Judd's character in the future. I could really see that because that's just the kind of person that she it, the she is in that movie. This uh, is the kind of similar vibe that you get from Frances McDormand's character, just somebody who's kind of touring life, just kind of taking a look at various different ideas of what life could be and what it has been, and uh, and and just the all the experiences that she packs into every every moment of life. It's beautiful that way. And Ruby in Paradise was re-released this week, so I, right. I do have it on the list right before the classic, so we can uh, you can just up to you how much time we spend on it, because like I sure. said, we just recorded a two-hour podcast. <laughs> uh, but, I mean, this rightfully deserves all the attention it's getting. Uh, fantastic movie. I mean, I'm still going to lean towards, you know, uh, Promising Young Woman or something like that, because I'm more into mm-hmm. that type of movie, but... You know, this is what I wanted Three Billboards to be in a way. You know, it's, it really is phenomenal and deserves all the accolades it's getting. The Blackout. The Blackout, uh, directed by Daniela DiCarlo and uh, starring a cast of people you've never heard of before. Actually, a movie that was made back in 2019 uh, that's just now getting out there because, uh, you know, the COVID and all that stuff. Yeah, there's actually uh, a movie called The Blackout that came out in 2020, which is making... <laughs> Searching for this a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> so very, very true. And it's so unlike that movie, no. which is a big, <laughs> loud sci-fi movie. This is just a little tiny uh, character movie about uh, this group of girls who live in this New York apartment uh, just about the time that Hurricane Sandy is hitting. And uh, they are all together for this party that they throw that the, they invited some friends to. And uh, throughout the night, they're just going to have these lengthy conversations. And, this is a really a movie about um, about film language telling a story that uh, that is so simple and yet so complex uh, because they, everybody's talking a lot, but not everybody. But they're not saying exactly what's on their mind. They're not telling you what's going on. It's not explanatory. It's all talking around or revealing themselves in different ways or revealing yourself w- with the way you react to something that someone else said uh, is far more revealing than what you actually say. And that is so much more of like real life than 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 uh, so many other movies. And I really appreciated this. Daniela DiCarlo is really a, a very good director. Uh, and, and you can tell because she's got all of these characters and all of this dialogue. And yet visually, the movie is, is as interesting or more interesting than anything that anyone has to say. And there's a the centerpiece of this film is just this lengthy conversation by candlelight between all the characters uh, telling a story about themselves that the that they feel is important uh, and revealing about themselves or a deep secret that they've never talked about before. And instead of those moments uh, being the ones that actually reveal them and reveal a thing about them, it's really more how they react to what other people say that says more about them 
than anything they say in their actual story. And I love that. Uh, I also love just the little visual touches that she throws in throughout. It's just a, such a smartly directed movie. Nobody's going to see this, unfortunately, <laughs> because they can't find it based on that title. But I like this movie a lot. Yeah, you compared it to a millennial big chill minus the, what's the word you used? <laughs> the uh, soundtrack that's better than the movie? Well, <laughs> <laughs> and the pretension. The pretension. The pretension. <laughs> Uh, I mean, I liked The Big Chill when I saw it way back when, but I haven't gone back and watched it again. So yeah. uh, even when it turned 30, I didn't watch it. But again, this was, I watched, I had to watch all my movies like yesterday. <laughs> so this one didn't make the cut. <laughs> We're, I watched a lot of movies this week, but yeah. highly enough, there's so many movies on this week's episode that it's going to seem like I didn't watch shit. <laughs> but uh, I mean, it sounds fascinating. Uh, yeah, I really like it. Um, look up Daniela DiCarlo. That way you yes, can maybe find you, it that way. That's where I found uh, the picture. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, I actually had a little interaction with her on Twitter, which was really nice. And uh, uh, she said uh, when I when she read my comparison to the big shield, she's like, that's what I was going for. And it's like, yes. <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah. All right. Silk Road. I was going to watch this till I read your review. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Silk Road is based off of a true story about uh, the Silk Road, which is a website that a lot that was created to be the Amazon.com of the dark web and and drugs. Uh, this guy created it. Uh, <coughs> sorry, he created it basically to uh, kind of maybe based off of his libertarian beliefs that uh, certain that the war on drugs is futile and that drugs should be um, you know on the market and available to people to use if they choose. Uh, that's at least what he's saying. The reality is he's just a guy who is looking to make some money. <laughs> that's really what it comes down to. And Nick Robinson uh, in his performance captures that pretty well. Uh, he he actually plays this guy who's based off a real guy uh, really well. And he actually gets to kind of the, the, the empty core of the character better than the movie does because the movie – uh, as directed by Tiller Russell, seems to want to side with him. As, he, as It seems to be like, I don't know if the director is a libertarian himself, but he keeps mentioning this libertarianism and, and that, that it's important to the character. And it kind of feels like at the end when he's talking about this guy ended up getting a life sentence, even though he didn't actually kill anybody. All he did was create this website uh, and, and then tried to pay people to get killed. Right. <laughs> <laughs> that uh, turned out to be, you know, he was talking to the cops when he was hiring people to do the murders on his behalf. Um, so he was a terrible guy who probably deserves life in prison for what he got. But the movie wants to, to believe that he was, uh, you know, he's a victim. Uh, and, and especially at the end, they've got this, you know, this crawl on the screen telling you that he got a life sentence, even though nobody technically died. Well, he did order two murders. Regardless, he also created a website that began as well. I'm going to let people sell some weed, and this will be you know be all about you know psychedelics, safe drugs. Then it grows up to to cocaine and meth, and then he's allowing arms dealers and child pornographers to tr- to trade and what they trade in on his website. And the movie doesn't even bother to fucking mention it. They don't even mention the the illegal arms dealers that he was allowing to work on the Silk Road. You didn't mention the the child pornographers or how he wrote blog on the website telling child pornographers how they could get away with their child pornography as long as you as long as the cops don't see you open the the package you're okay (laughs) he's literally telling them how to get away with it uh but he's he's the victim here right no but uh, the the thing about it is is the performances are so much better than the movie and uh, I haven't seen Jason Clark be this good at something in a long time. He's been in a lot of really terrible movies and he's pretty good here in this character. That's basically functionary. You don't know. I don't believe this character that he plays actually exists. He's an amalgam probably of several different uh, DNA DEA agents who are tracking the Silk Road. Uh, but he plays this old school cop who gets busted down to cyber crimes and then uses his old school cop stuff to, uh, to go after the Silk Road. And he's the one who makes the bust, even though, technically the computer guys made bust. Well, that's kind of when I read that in your review and then watched the trailer, you can't not unsee that, you know, (laughs) you know, all of a sudden I don't buy into the movie anymore because the old school (laughs) ways of doing things in this highly technical uh, world. There's no way (laughs) that, 
you know, I mean, I work with old school people. I know that you're, and I, that just kind of turned me off right away. I, I do think we need to just lose the word libertarian. No one knows what it means anymore. It's right. turned into, uh, you know, there's people a, I like a lot who claim to be libertarian, and then there's other people who just want to say the libertarian so they can say the N word again. You know, it's <laughs> there. There's decent people that want to be that, and I, I understand. And quite frankly, if he was just selling drugs, I don't really give a shit. Everything else, though, the guns and the pornography and the murdering people are trying to get people murdered. That's horrible. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I mean, yeah, sure. You started with the right idea. I. I, I the drug, the war on drugs. I watched this documentary. My wife made me watch this week on Netflix about the war. I mean, I knew everything, but how basically how the U.S. government's financing it or using it to, uh, to I don't know. It's not even worth talking about. Everybody knows it. Reagan, Bush, Clinton, all right. of them are involved. It's not a big deal. But yeah, I just I, I could have watched one more movie last night and it was going to be this, and I was just like, you know what? I'm going to go listen to Slipknot in the basement and. <laughs> <laughs> that helped me get through the Trump years. <laughs> Never liked that band before. But anyway, uh, yeah, it's out there. It seems if you want to watch the performance, I guess. It's on uh, Apple TV. Actually, you can rent it on anywhere, I think. You have to pay for it on Apple TV as well. Uh, burn it all. Burn it all. This is a. Uh, <laughs> this movie is so awesome. I love this movie. Uh, this is a movie about uh, just basically a woman who who's just had it. She is just done with men and she can't, just done with all the bullshit that she's had to put up with. And she's willing to say it like so many movies are unwilling to say what it is that they're doing. No, she's really just, she's, she's fucking tired of men and that's what it comes down to. And then she's involved in this like outsized plot that happens to be just consistently men just trying to get in her, just get in her way and just fuck with her. And she's like, she's just done with it. I fucking love this. Uh, <laughs> there's this repeated bit throughout the movie where people just kill her keep asking her why are you so angry or they tell her to calm down or why are women so emotional <laughs> she's just like she just continues to just tell these guys to go fuck themselves every single time like why are you so angry well they'd taken her hostage at that point and we're trying to t- steal her mother's organs and they're asking her why she's angry they're telling her to calm down when they got guns pointed at her you know it's so it's just so smart uh, and such a wonderful performance. Elizabeth Cotter stars as Alex, and Alex is somebody who, when we meet her, they, they, the movie begins with this great joke about she's suicidal and she's been on hold with the suicide hotline for 47 minutes. <laughs> And then it goes it goes from there the call gets interrupted because she gets a call from a hospital in her hometown telling her that her mom is dying and telling her that you've got only a little while if you want to come here and see her before she passes away by the time she arrives her mother has died uh, and she meets up with her ex-boyfriend who's now, who's now a cop even though he was an abusive asshole when they were together uh they really did the whole thing that that whole relationship drove her apart from her mother uh, she decides that uh, if, when he tells her that his mom has probably been already been cremated by now, she's like confused because that's not what her mom wanted. Well, she knows that her mom didn't want to be cremated. So she goes to the funeral home. She encounters a couple of people who are stealing her mom's body. She ends up getting taken hostage. And from there, she ends up just getting into a series of fights with these men who just <laughs> continue to condescend and underestimate her throughout. And the way Elizabeth Cotter plays this role is rem- – it's typical, you know, typically people will compare her to other female, you know, action heroes or something. But really what it reminded me of more than anything was Bruce Willis in Die Hard and just how just how he's just a, how pissed off and annoyed he was <laughs> to be in the situation that he was in. And she kind of captures that energy really well. I, I adore this movie. Yeah, I saw it. I, I don't like it as much as you, but I do like it. I agree with. Just about everything. I, I'm not as big on the performance. Uh, I don't think she has. I mean, she's a legit badass, but she's not the best actor in the world. Like, she I think doesn't she's a have the woman for the right. most part. She doesn't have the charisma of a Bruce Willis or a, even like if you want to compare to other female uh, leads, Charlie's Throne or whatever. But she's way more. The action scenes are awesome. Uh, it, it is funny the way everything you're describing and the way they do it, and it's really smart. It's well directed. Uh, I 
the performances do hold me back a little bit from enjoying it as much as you did. Uh, and again, I don't know. I don't remember the mood I was in going into it, too, if I'm just getting hung up on stuff. It's not a bad performance by any means. It's just not the like, I don't feel like we're going to be talking about burn it all. Like it's die hard in 20 years is mm. more what I'm getting at. But that doesn't mean I mean, she is a legit badass and the action scenes are fantastic. And there's a lot to learn from this movie. I mean, just the idea of what you're saying, you know, telling her to calm down while they're <laughs> <laughs> holding a gun on her. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's and that she's perfectly calm, and they're the ones who are freaking right. out. Right, it's insanely well written, insanely well directed. That's the only thing holding me off is a lot, and it's probably more on me than anything. Is just the the it, it, she generally comes I, off as annoyed. You know, Bruce Willis it, it comes off as annoyed with charisma, and mm-hmm. in reality, that's actually not how it works. And so, this is actually probably more of a real performance than what Bruce Willis does. Uh, yeah. But for whatever reason, I it, I didn't enjoy it as much because of that. But everything I, I else you're saying is right on. Much of my positive review is based off of just a couple of little things. Mm-hmm. Just There's one line in the movie that's my favorite line in the movie all year long. I can do anything you can do bleeding. <laughs> such, I mean, delivered with just such perfection. Oh, God, I loved it. Oh, I Man, I love that line. It just yeah. made me fall on the floor and i think i'm wanting it more heightened you know she, yeah and and maybe it, it's similar to we just got done doing the a24 podcast where josh talked about hereditary and what he wanted it to be and i'm wanting you know a heightened more charismatic uh yeah. delivery and i think we're you getting want is, you to play this character <laughs> <laughs> but what we're getting is a real performance i guess and that's you know i'll, I'll happily say i'm bringing it you know that to it but uh it, it is it is insanely well written, insanely well directed. But to, I also love that he made an action movie that's also about the way men talk to oh, women yeah. and using using this body snatching plot as a way to comment on the, the ludicrous way that men talk to women so thoughtlessly and so without even just the the, the condescension and the, and the underestimating and just the way they do it throughout uh, the way they speak to her and treat her throughout is just, you can the way she plays it and just being so over it. She's heard it so many times of men t- telling her to calm down, like her boyfriend who literally beat her up and was the reason why she and her mother were, were apart from each other. And he's telling, he tells her to relax or why can't you just get over it? Or <laughs> you beat her up. <laughs> you, you punched her repeatedly throughout your relationship. You want her to just pretend that didn't happen. Oh, you're so emotional. <laughs> Fuck you. Die. <laughs> Fucker. And that you're right. The the writing is so intelligent and so smart and funny and, uh, and the direction too. Uh, I agree completely. It, it really is. It, it stands alone as its own kind of action movie that, and the, the action scenes are fantastic you know it's let's not then I'm, I'm not trying to take anything away from that this movie is worth seeing uh who knows what mood i was in when i saw it, it was the first one i watched this week but again I, I don't love it as much as you but i definitely mm-hmm. appreciate it and again it's back to the there's no corporate in this movie you definitely yeah. have it is i appreciate it for existing and I, I want movies like this uh, so I'm glad at I think, least I got that. I think another thing I loved is I just want I just want somebody to talk to bad guys the way that she talks to bad guys because all the bad guys in this movie are bad guys from other movies that nobody ever says anything to them. They just allow them to be who they are, and she will not allow them to be as cool as they think they are. And, and I'm one, and I and I know the the irony of me wanting a someone to pretend to be a badass. And deliver it that way, as opposed to an actual badass saying it the way she would say it in real life. <laughs> you know, I, I understand uh, how the oxymoron of what I'm saying <laughs> is, but uh, I don't know. It, it could have been even more fun, I think. But that uh, that doesn't that's not what this movie is, and that's me bringing it to it. And I shouldn't do that as a viewer, but I'm a human being. <laughs> mm-hmm. Test pattern. I could not find this one anywhere. It's only available on Kino Larber's website, ah. uh, I believe. Uh, vir- virtual screening there. Uh, this movie is is a tough one, and it's another one that's commenting on on misogyny and the way men treat women uh, as a 
you know, the way is sometimes men without even realizing you treat somebody like yours, they're your possession, you know, even as somebody can be as loving and caring as they are and still refer to someone as mine or I, as a property, as you will, you know, uh, and, and kind of removing their humanity in that way. Uh, the, the story goes here that these two people meet at a bar one night and they have a good vibe together and they're very sweet together and they have a very romantic start to their relationship and they, they develop uh, into a relationship where they begin living together uh, as a, you know, there's a white guy and a black woman and she takes on a new job and she's you know, starting to change a little bit in ways that are uh, kind of, you don't even recognize it really that she's changing all that much, but she's changing in these big major ways when you step away from it. And one night she decides to go out with a friend of hers and he's totally cool about it. Like I said, they're, they're two very loving, charming people together. But while she's out with her friend, she ends up getting drugged and raped and she returns home the next morning. And he says that we should go, you know, we need to go get a rape kit. We need to go talk to the police. And she's really, she's kind of like, I don't really want to do that. I don't want to deal with this. I don't even know what happened because I was you know, out cold. I don't even remember it. Uh, but he's insistent upon it. He drags her to, a, to the hospital and, and is, you know, very adamant uh, about them. You know, they, you need to give us a rape kit. Uh, they don't have one. They don't have a person who can deliver one. So they've got to go to a different hospital. And then another hospital, they get, end up going to another one to try and get it. And finally, they do get it. And then he calls the cops and she's telling him not to because, again, she doesn't know exactly what happened. She can't even identify the guy who did it. Uh, and she would really just like to try and put it behind them and he won't and the way that he acts so entitled in this situation like they should have they should just give this to us because we deserve it and and she's like just i just stop he won't listen to her and the disconnect between the two of them and then you slowly realize that he's not abusive but he's he's so self-involved he doesn't realize that he's not allowing her to be herself and make her own decisions and have her own power in their relationship and that the way that's revealed via this situation is so beautiful and dramatic and, and well put together and they do it in 82 minutes which uh, is really uh, i mean really impressive that they communicate all of that in that short amount of time it sounds like an amazing movie uh like where would you rank it in terms of like is it up there as well or is it just too serious to, i don't know it sounds like it would be right up there at the top of the list with you know, nomad land and some other things, or is it not artistic it, enough? Oh no, it's, it's absolutely brilliant. And it's, it is a, it's a top five movie of the year uh, in terms of being good. Um, I haven't written about it yet because I can't quite bring myself. I wrote, I read a review uh, by uh, Jordan, Cyr- Jordan Searles in uh, Hollywood reporter that is so good and so definitive about this movie that I don't feel I can do it justice the way that she did. And so I haven't written about it, but read her review and and you'll sense just how how amazing this movie is. Yeah, it sounds right up my. I mean, I'm I'm really fascinated by what, the way you describe that. Uh, and even the line, "Everything in the world is about sex, except sex. Sex is about power." That's that's a hell of a tagline. Yeah. <clears throat> Truth to power, some more social justice. <laughs> Those stupid SJWs. Uh, the guy who actually coined the term. Uh, <laughs> Is this the guy who termed it? Coined it? Serge Tankian and uh, and the Tom guy Morello. from Raging, Tom Morello. They came, they were actually the guys who came up with the with the term social justice warrior because that's what they wanted to be. They wanted social justice. <laughs> And so, yeah, uh, Truth to Power is about the about uh, Serge Tanky and the lead singer of uh, System of a Down, which is I've had a strange uh, relationship with that band. I never uh, it, about and, and it relates back to weirdly September 11th. Um, I was in radio at the time and I was you know on top of music at the time and very involved in music at that time. And after September 11th, I fell out of love with music. Uh, I had to, a week after September 11th, I had less than a week, five days after, I had to go back to Mix 96 radio in the Quad Cities and host a disco dance party. And I called my boss like the Wednesday of that week because the show was on Saturday. I said, we're not going to do the, the disco show Saturday, right? And he's like, why not? And I was kind of like, well, I, I, I can't. I can't do it. 2000 people just died. And he's like, well, we, we got a show to do. 
<laughs> so I complete that moment kind of divorced me from music for many years just because I couldn't listen to anything and be happy anymore. And at about that time, that surge to the system of down uh, became one of the biggest things in the world for a time around that time uh, with hit records. And and somehow I managed to not see that. I managed to not witness any of their <laughs> any of their career during that time even though they were one of the biggest things in the world. And so this movie comes back around and it reminded me of all those feelings and emotions and, and how directly involved he was in the moments after, you know, September 11th, uh, being on the Howard Stern show and, and talking about, you know, social justice, not necessarily saying that America deserved it, but that, you know, this is reaping what you sow when it comes to your involvement in the Middle East. Uh, and, you know, the band came together over, over their uh, shared heritage uh, in Armenia, uh, which the Armenian genocide plays a big role in this movie as well, which is, leads up to a very powerful ending of this. It's another super short movie, only about 77 minutes long, but it tells a, an amazing story about how uh, art is can be revolutionary. I, I love this. Uh, I'm a big System of a Down fan, and I I was, you know, when their first album came out, it was I went and saw, I was going to see Metallica for the first time, and it was... System of a Down, this Power Man 5000, Kid Rock, and Corn. Like, all these bands are at this height. Like, System of a Down just started. Corn's at their peak. Kid Rock's at his peak. And I've never heard of System of a Down, so I went out and bought the record. And I was just like, holy shit, this is a, like this is probably the second best band on the bill. Uh, and they went first, and we got there. And ever since then, I've just absolutely fell in love with them. And then you find out. You know, and Serge would be the one I like the most. You know, as a guitar player, oddly enough, the guitar player is not in this movie. The rest of the band is, <laughs> and oddly enough, they haven't made a record in a while. And they also talk about how they don't like how Serge is, you know, trying to bring politics to the band. Uh, their best songs are political. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other ones are okay; they're fine. But yeah. it's like, and if you listen to their records, the more and more deeper into their the newer stuff darren the guitar player sings more and he's more of a backup singer and those songs are okay but the ones where serge is out front those are the best songs because he's got such a cool unique voice where he, he the way he scats is cool the way he screams is cool the way he sings is cool it's all neat you know he goes off and makes a jazz record later on and uh, he does a lot of cool things but it's just such a bummer that they won't let him and Part of it's his fault, too, for being stubborn and forcing his will on the band. The drummer's a Trump supporter. I mean, the drummer's a fucking weirdo. Uh, but it's weird. They're also all friends. I went and saw him live just right before, not last year, obviously, but the year before. Uh, and it was a great show. Uh, they just, It's weird. Uh, but this movie is its really all about the Armenian genocide and yeah. what uh, they did to help get the United States to at least recognize it. Uh, not uh, among other things, uh, but it, I don't know. He, it, it really is a, a good movie. It's an easy movie to get through, and, uh, and, and it was cool of him to include, you know, members of his band to talk about how they were annoyed. And I mean, it's a very honest, you know, how social justice warriors can be annoying, and how sometimes what they're doing isn't effective, and they're actually being hurtful. When the way he handled September 11th. What he said was true, but the timing and the way he was doing it didn't make a whole lot of sense, mm-hmm. you know. And it was him dealing, you know, coming to grips with that and learning what to do. And I, I think as someone who wants to be more, for lack of a better phrase, woke, uh, it, it does a good job of, you know, when do you shut up? When do you say, you know, it, it does kind of show you there's a way to go about making an example and, you know, doing the right thing. And I just found it very honest, very cool, and it was a lot about the a lot more about the band than I thought it was going to be. I, don't know, I really liked it. Yeah, it's an incredible documentary, and and uh, a very emotional, uh, especially when you get to to the end, and you've got the people of Armenia asking him to to come home in mm-hmm. uh, this massive group of people, and just the the emotion that he's feeling, and the uh, the, the change that they're making happen is. <laughs> and uh, there's a little handbook, everybody, in case you want one on how to uh, on on how to uh, protest, if, in case you ever need one. Uh, Armenia already did it. Just pay attention. Yeah, it was pretty 
that was cool too. The what inspired him to do a system of a down concert inspired a protest. <laughs> it's just amazing. And what's really cool is they do a good job of. I mean, he's a big rock star. They make him very human in this, mm. and very small. And then at the same time, you see him leading this movement where he almost doesn't even realize he's leading it at times, and you get a genuine reaction from him just kind of not realizing how big of an impact he's actually having. Uh, and it's, it's that alone is fascinating, but along with with what he accomplished is what's really fascinating. But I just, I really thought this movie was really good. And I think people should watch, even if you're not a fan of system of the down, I think it's, I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, and then (laughs) I, I feel kind of dumb because I look back, you know, uh, to like 2002, 2003, thinking about why isn't anybody protesting the war? Like, where, <laughs> where, where are all the great, uh, where are those great protests yeah, songs? Against you know? machine go. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I couldn't find, but their mainstream pop like doesn't have anything. You know, there's no, there's no, you know, great. Uh, it didn't feel like the '60s. It didn't feel like there was anybody actually doing anything important and. Uh, and somehow I feel like I know it sounds like tinfoil hat conspiracy theory, but I really feel like like System of a Down was pushed away from the mainstream and still managed to be, you know, they had the number one record in the country. And usually something like that's going to permeate even to somebody like me who's not paying attention. I'm still going to know what the number one album in the country is or that, or that there's a big hit song out there. This these guys went to number one without anybody noticing it seemingly, and no mainstream attention, no you know talk show appearances, uh, no MTV. They get banned from they get banned from radio. They're like they're, a couple of their songs are on that list that Clear Channel famously put out, banning these songs. Don't play them. Uh, and it's incredible to think that their fans were so loyal that they that they still managed to make them one of the biggest bands in the world. Yeah, I mean, I do think you might have you might have separated yourself a little bit. I mean, they were pretty big. Uh, I mean, it was hard to get away from that Chop Suey song. And they, there's a fun part in the movie that has nothing to do with the rest of the movie. That song, the lyrics make no sense, and you find out how he wrote it. Like, literally just opening up books and pulling lines out of a book. Uh, <laughs> it was pretty fascinating. Uh, but, I mean, they were a pretty big band, but it was cool because it was right after he had tra- you know wrote that thing about America on like the day after September 11th on the band's website and people were protesting and Howard Stern shit all over him and even had him on to shit on him some more then they went to number one <laughs> it was like after all of that <laughs> but their song I mean Chop Suey Toxicity BYOB the, the, it's hard to avoid those songs uh, they are out there in the mainstream pop culture but he didn't get it. Like when you look at the Dixie Chicks and the way that they got hammered by the by everyone in the media, he got off. He walked away from that. His band was still number one. Uh, but Dixie were, Chicks are still around and still big. But I mean, they got. It's just a, a notion of just how of, of the misogyny of our of our mainstream culture that they they became the posters who got hammered down and punched constantly and and you know there wasn't jokes about uh, about Serge Tankian and System of Down on Letterman that night. Well, yeah, but that's not entirely fair. They they were known they, they against the band's will. They became known as a political band. Rage Against the Machine never got shit on either. You know, mm-hmm. that's and, what I'm saying. That I think Dixie I, Chicks got it because they were women, and these guys didn't. I didn't disagree. get that, that I think hammer the, because they're men. No, I think they got it because they Dixie Chicks never established themselves as a protesting anti-establishment band. I mean. Yes, it, I'm not going to pretend that there definitely was a level of what you're saying, but I think more than anything, if they were known as a band that was always anti-establishment, I mean, I think that played more of a role than the misogyny, but I, I'm not going to pretend like misogyny didn't exist. You're 100% right. But, I mean, people just don't like them, so they don't talk about them. You know, I, I don't know. They It was against their will, but they were definitely a political band. Uh, at that point and people just kind of either loved it or hated it and they didn't talk about it uh, but anyway anything else on truth of power no it's available everywhere ruby in paradise got re-released this week from 1993 yeah uh, quiver distribution picked this one up and uh, the director uh, victor nunez who spent the last 10 years or so just kind of uh, working on this movie and uh, <clears throat> um 
remastering it for this for this particular opportunity for re-release. Uh, it's the first film from Ashley Judd, and uh, it's about a girl who moves to uh, Florida uh, to a, a tourist mecca in Florida uh, to. Uh, she just has nothing else to do. Uh, she's kind of a tourist, uh, and this is a tourist destination. And really, she's a tourist of life. She's just kind of viewing different lives and taking them in and having little experiences here and there and sort of commenting on it and just taking it all in. And maybe she's going to go this way or that way. And I really love the way this movie is structured. Just It's structured with her not being a typical character in any way. Uh, she she makes these decisions that are just kind of based off of, I kind of want to do this now, and now I kind of want to do this, and I'm going to have this experience. And then, but then, of course, she's got all these obstacles in her way, like you know, be, e- economics. You know, this movie, uh, it's like she talks about being two weeks away from being on the streets, which she's not wrong. And still today, that's the case for so many people. Uh, that's it's still resonant today. Um Ashley Judd is just brilliant in this movie. And then you've got Todd Field, who plays uh, the sort of love interest you in, in a mainstream movie would be quirky and fun. But it, the reality of that character is so much more interesting because he's unintentionally misogynistic. He's unintentionally, you know, his traditionalist values minimize her in you know trying to turn her into a typical wife mother type that he thinks he wants and or you know that that she, that she likes things like he's a very pretentious guy who who feels that everything that anybody likes is representative of everything that's wrong in the world and, and his superiority she constantly undermines his superiority in a very in a very smart way uh, I adore this movie. I got a chance to talk to the director uh, this week for a new podcast that I'm doing on my radio outlet at IllinoisNewsNow.com, where you can hear me talking to Victor Nunez and talking about the movie. And uh, yeah, it's one of my favorites now. That's cool. W- where would you compare it to No Bad Land? Is it good, better, or is it just hard to compare against each other? I think, like you said, they're, they're so similar in so many ways. Uh, I think, really, Ruby, uh, the character in Nomadland could could be Ruby as a kid, or could right. be Ruby as an adult. I mean, uh, they, they share a lot, of, a lot of traits in that way, and I love that. That's very cool. All right, let's move on to our classic. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the main event for the linear legitimate and universally recognized undisputed classic it's donald sutherland in a bathtub with a kid go (laughs) that one did stick out to me too it was weird and awkward but uh you know you know bob i i'm constantly concerned about uh our place in the mainstream and uh, our download numbers so i thought to myself you know what we need is more Paul Mazursky because nothing. The kids love nothing more <laughs> than a good Paul Mazursky movie. So we double up this week. <laughs> it's two. <laughs> I thought for sure after last week we had so many nice things to say about, or I did at least, have, about Bob Carroll, Ted, and Alice, and how uh, unique and interesting that movie was, and you know, one of Quentin Tarantino's favorite movies of all time. So I thought, well. Maybe there's some like undiscovered genius there with Paul Paul Mazursky. Like maybe he's like uh, this hidden gem of a legendary director uh, that I just haven't you know looked into before. And so, well, here's a weird movie. This is the follow up to Bob Carroll and Ted and Alice. And uh, I'm curious, what's it going to be like? And it's unwatchable (laughs) from my perspective. I hate this movie so much. I haven't even finished it yet. That's how much I hate it. Um, There's a scene in this movie. To just to kind of gauge just how much I hate this movie, the, there's a scene in this movie that reminded me of 1517 to Paris, <laughs> which they, that movie has a scene where they just go and buy gelato and they're just talking about gelato for like five minutes. And this movie has a scene where Donald Sutherland and Ellen Burstyn are buying a house. And here's the kitchen. Can we go upstairs? Yes, you can go upstairs. Here's the upstairs. It's got it's it's got a traditionally Spanish look to it. And I'm like, Fucking buy the house or fucking don't. I don't care. Somebody do something. <laughs> I was so mad. I was so bored. I was so irritated. And then it's got these Fellini scenes. They just basically just made me go, why aren't I watching a Fellini movie right now? I could be watching Eight and a Half. If you're, you're going to spend all this time talking about and referring to Eight and a Half, I should just go watch that. Or Jean Moreau has a a, 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 a cameo in this uh, from Jules and Jim. And I'm like, I could be watching Jules and Jim. <laughs> I could be watching that. I love that movie. I could be watching that right now. Instead of suffering through Donald Sutherland 
being insufferable, talking about the movie ideas that he doesn't like or that he does like or that nobody else likes that he likes, dancing with naked black people on a beach for some reason. Like, fuck you. Fuck this movie. I hate it. There has never been a movie more up its ass. It's on the ass <laughs> this one. So true. This is literally about Paul Mazursky not knowing what to do after Bob Carroll, Ted and Alice, and wanting to do something that means something, but also wanting to make something as good as eight and a half. You know, when you're inspired by a movie, you don't sit and talk about it the whole time in the movie you're making about the movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, to the point where Fellini actually shows up in the movie. <laughs> right. I mean, it would be like if like Death Proof was nothing but vanishing point references. Now they do make a reference to <laughs> right. it in it, but that you know, it's kind of what or anything Tarantino does. Once upon a time in Hollywood, it's all about Bob Carroll, Ted, and Alice. You know, because <laughs> that was one of the movies that inspired that movie. Uh, yeah, and he never mentions it. That mm-hmm. it, it, it's just odd. This is like you know, I made a cell park joke on the bonus episode, but Cartman would hate this movie. <laughs> Talk about hippie bullshit. Uh, <laughs> Fuck yes. Fuck yes, it is. Oh, my God. I, I didn't expect to hate this so much, I but I really did. Uh, I thought, because I, I kind of like movies about Hollywood. You know, we were just talking about The Disaster Artist before, which is a movie about movies. That's a really great movie about movies. And this is a movie about movies. And it's terrible. It's, like I said, I feel it's unwatchably bad. And Roger Ebert gave this four stars. And I can only imagine that's got to be Stockholm Syndrome setting in after <laughs> the first three years of his career, having suffered through so many similar mainstream movies. He was just was looking for anything that was going to be slightly different. I can only imagine because otherwise I can't understand it. Maybe this movie is just such a movie of its time that it can't exist anywhere outside of 1970. I don't know. Well, it's and, awful. And I think uh, I appreciate it in a way. In that, again, you don't see the corporate in this because right. cor- corporate's like, there's no money in this thing. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's about a director who doesn't know what to do next, so he just kind of essentially films himself. I mean, films himself, only it's Donald Sutherland. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, the daughter in the bathtub with him is his, the, uh, Paul Mazursky's daughter. Uh, God, so that's weird. It makes it a little less weird. At least he knows the people involved. You know, right, right, right. I'm sure he had shorts on, but it, it still was... You know, I hope he got as much shit as Nicole Kidman got <laughs> you know, 20, 30 years later, because uh, that's way more creepier than Nicole Kidman in the bathtub with the kid. Uh, but I, I don't know. It, it I can appreciate it on that level, but it also is a, in my opinion, like a disastrous failure uh, and not in the fun way either. You know, it's not like we're the room the stuff you can take out of it and enjoy. This is just boring. And oh, you, you dislike the people involved. It makes you hate hippies even more. <laughs> uh, that said, it's not like Donald Sutherland's bad. I mean, he's not right. the performance. There's nothing wrong with it. It's just long and boring. And you're just kind of annoyed. It's like, just pick your fucking movie and make it and move on. But yeah. And <laughs> so I, 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 like I said, I didn't even finish it. I was so annoyed. Uh, how did this end? I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, it, it was another Fellini nightmare. Just <laughs> there's a few of those throughout. There's throughout. more than one. Yeah, I mean, there's like three. <laughs> but I mean, it's in a way, it's a slice of life movie where you just here's what happened during this time. It's not like there's an ending. You know, yeah. it's just all right. We're out of time. Uh, and part of me couldn't tell. I mean. It was just so out of touch, too. And maybe it's because of the time it's. Where I'm watching it in versus when it came out. But uh, And they didn't, like the Alex in Wonderland part, they didn't dig into the Wonderland part of it enough for right. that to be fascinating. I don't know, just kind of a mess. And, it's, I mean, the comparison doesn't make any sense. In, in, in the performance of, of Donald Sutherland, who's very savvy, about all that's happening around him. As weird as it all gets, he's very savvy about all of it. He's, you know, he's playing the game. He understands how Hollywood works. He's not, he's not a babe in the woods. He's not an innocent. Alice was an innocent drawn into Wonderland and, and taken on a journey. He's not an innocent wandering into Hollywood being taken on a journey. So I don't understand the comparison, why they decided to make that the center point of the film, because it doesn't make any sense. But he's aware and then he's awkward. And then I just don't like, it doesn't make, 
I, I don't know. It does. It's not consistent enough for me. Like the awkward scenes. Like at some points, it's like he's Tommy Wiseau, but then other times he's Paul Mazursky. You know, it's not the same guy the whole time. I don't know. It, it yeah. really was. Well, at one point, he asks his friends when they last masturbated, and this is very funny to him, and I don't understand why it's funny or why you're having this conversation. What's this supposed to reveal about anybody? Uh, I guess it's supposed to be about about how you know, even married men still masturbate, which, okay, great. Does that mean that they're unsatisfied? I don't understand what your point is here. What's the funny part? We get to the funny part. Plus, we don't know the characters that he's talking to, so we can't we don't have any context to to make it make that be funny it's funny to him because they're his friends maybe maybe this is something that the come that comes up a lot amongst them but it feels like a conversation that you're witnessing among a group of strangers and you don't know why it's funny <laughs> and so again the, the up its own ass aspect of this then he's got this thing that he does throughout the movie if you were on a desert island by yourself and you could only have three foods the rest of your life what would they be who the fuck cares D- does that reveal something about any of these fucking characters one time does it mean anything to anyone what does that reveal nothing Fellini likes strawberries fucking great thanks <laughs> yeah it's it's shit like that that makes it I me mean, not like the movie that said you know if you look at all the great artists they always have that piece of shit that they needed to do <laughs> to get to the next thing you know uh-huh. uh, and so i can appreciate it on that level but I don't know. You know, it's like Metallica needed St. Anger. Aerosmith needed Rock in a Hard Place. You know, <laughs> Van Halen needed to do that Gary Sharon thing. Uh, I, I don't know. And sometimes you just need to do something to move forward. And so I can appreciate it on that level. I just don't like it. So far, from my experience of Paul Mazursky, I'm going to say, I'm going to compare him more to say like a band like Extreme that has one good record. And then <laughs> everything else is kind of bullshit. I love Extreme, though. <laughs> you compare him to Nelson or something. <laughs> I just uh, I don't think he's the Van Halen of directors. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wasn't meaning to. And quite frankly, that was like Van Halen's last second to last yeah. album. So that didn't even really <laughs> prove my point at all. Uh, but let's move on to Paul Mazursky and <laughs> keep the kids entertained. Yeah. <laughs> Scenes from a wall stars Woody Allen and Bette Midler as a couple who are uh, cheating on each other, who are going to reveal that to each other on their anniversary party day while they're at a mall in Los Angeles. And man, uh, this movie is at least more, entertaining than Alex in Wonderland. It has a structure to it. Uh, it makes sense uh, what happens, but you're still, you're, you're watching two really shitty people be shitty to each other for 90 minutes. That's pretty much the experience of scenes from a mall. And, and you'd said something in our chat about how, the, how, how I, it was essentially the way I took it was like how, how an actor or a director can reveal themselves through the roles that they play in the movies that they make. And Woody Allen has done that to us over and over again. And we've just kind of, we've just kind of taken it as him. You know, he's so honest about himself. Right. We're not exactly examining what he's being honest about, which is that he's a really shitty human being. <laughs> right. Well, we started with Manhattan and we sat <laughs> right. and we watched it. We knew what was about it. And it was like, this is really good though, but that yeah. is kind of creepy. <laughs> And then basically what it came down to is I was like, you know, I was comparing him to Louis C.K. and Marilyn Manson, where it's like yeah. Louis C.K. was the biggest com- comedian out there because his comedy was so raw and honest about what he was doing to people. <laughs> and Marilyn Manson, I mean, it, people were defending him because he was so, it's all what he does is he's up front about and he's showing you and you should mm-hmm. know better when you get into it. And I was like, no, <laughs> it's. <laughs> You know, and I'll be honest, I've, I I like Marilyn Manson's music, and it, it's hard for me to want, you know, to say these things. And I'm sure you're a big Woody Allen fan. It's hard to, yeah. you want to defend it to an extent, but the art is definitely, and he didn't even make this movie, but it made me go back to movies like Annie Hall and Manhattan that are actually very, very f- great. And, yeah. but you're, you're seeing, uh, he's always talking about young, young girls in it, and he does it again here. And mm-hmm. even the when he can't help but when he's being too honest to Bette Midler in this movie, I could see him saying those things. And maybe, you know, I'm I'm totally projecting, but right. we have reason to project. Uh, 
and I don't know, it just, it, it really, it was kind of the nail in the coffin for me and Woody Allen. And sadly, it's not even his movie. Uh, and you had said something about if he had directed this, it'd be like, he would be married to Julia Roberts right. <laughs> in, 19, in 1991, Julia Roberts, you know, somebody who was like 30 years younger than him. And it would be about how she, how much younger she is and how she doesn't understand him. And they're both cheating on each other and they're still really shitty to each other. And she's more intelligent than she should be. But uh, that, that would be the Woody Allen version of this would be him and Julia Roberts together, which I think he did at one point put himself with, with Julia Roberts in the movie. Uh, he does. He, like you said, he, that, he reveals he's revealed himself multiple times to be like we see we take it in as just his his flaws and him being honest about his flaws and we're not examining what those flaws are <laughs> and when you do right. when you really put your mind to it, it's like oh man he really is a piece of shit <laughs> and that doesn't make him not a great artist you know he's found a good way of taking that I mean, and clearly he picasso, struggles with it picasso was a bastard there's no there's no way around it you know yeah, I mean, it, it is still great art, and he, it, when you, it, it's something I'm clearly he's not proud of because he's bringing it into his movies. Louis C.K. the same thing, Marilyn uh, Manson probably not so much, but uh, it, 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 it just I don't know, I, I, I don't know. I'm curious. I mean, we may talk about the HBO Max series that's coming up over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, uh, but this is just that mixed with. How it kind of does the same thing, Bob, Bob and Carol and Ted and Alice. The oh, I'm cheating on you, and that was just like is this all he makes because <laughs> I watched this before <laughs> Alex in Wonderland. I'm like, great, he's gonna cheat on his wife on that one too. Uh, but this this is really more of a straight ahead comedy. Yeah, uh, and I, I, we, I, the best part of it was when Bette Midler kicked him in the balls. That was. <laughs> That was a great scene. Uh, yeah. But it's watchable. I'll give it that. But it's definitely not high art like Bob and Carol did analysis. Right. And then there's He Said, She Said. Elizabeth Perkins, uh, Kevin Bacon. Yeah. This is about uh, two TV reporters who get their own TV segment uh, where they're disagreeing with each other. And he's a man and she's a woman. And they've got different perspectives on how they see relationships. But they're going to fall in love and fuck this movie. It's <laughs> pretty much all I got to say. Works for me. Uh, next week, <laughs> we'll be going on four I hours, a, three hours. Go ahead. I got a, I got a lot. I got a surprise for you. We got a guest next week. Uh, really? Amy's coming back. Amy's going to join us next week. Sweet. What movie yeah, is she a fan of? Big well, she's a, she's a uh, been a big, big music fan for years. And so we've got uh, three music movies next week that uh, I thought that would be right in her wheelhouse. Sweet. Uh, we got The Vigil. Uh, that'll be streaming. Cherries on Apple TV. The United States versus Billie Holiday's on Hulu. Crazy About Her is on Netflix. We don't always get to the Netflix movies, but if we do, we do. Uh, I'll always throw out the what has become the new fishing with Gandhi is the last champion. Uh, <laughs> Jason Bryan, a Patreon supporter, and you know a friend of ours who's always advertising our podcast on his sites. He's drinking out of our coffee mug and stuff and putting it online. I appreciate that. Uh, he is in that movie. He's a Hall of Fame wrestling broadcaster. Uh, so at some point, I'm, I'm going to watch that movie. It just we had 47 movies this week. Uh, uh, that is available to rent right now. Uh, yeah, classic. I, oh, go ahead. I've watched 61 movies this year, by the way. <laughs> and it's not even March yet. <laughs> Our classic is The Coal Miner's Daughter. Uh, and in 1991, The Doors, My Heroes Have Always Been Cowboys and Shipwrecked came out. So, uh, yeah, it should be a fun week. Uh, yeah. I Let's see. You have any energy left for flick chart? <laughs> sure. All right. Witness or the Mexican? Uh, witness. I'll go with you on that one. Uh, San Andreas, Doctor Giggles. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh... I haven't thought about Doctor Giggles since 1992. Um, I'm sorry. I'm going out. I'm going in and out. I apologize. Um, San Andreas. 
Okay. <laughs> I don't remember Dr. Giggles, so. A fistful of dollars, alien resurrection. Fistful of dollars. Nightcrawler, battle royale. That's tough. Um, I guess I'd probably watch Nightcrawler. So, yeah, Nightcrawler. I'm going to go battle royale only because Nightcrawler is so effective it actually pissed me off a little bit. <laughs> And I dropped the quarter on the ground, so hold on. Bear with me, folks. <laughs> it is Tails. Battle Royale. Stuart Little Beetlejuice. <laughs> Beetlejuice. The Green Mile, The Village. <laughs> the Green Mile. Reluctantly. <laughs> Blade Runner, The Hunt for Red October. Blade Runner. Agreed. Logan, 101 Dalmatians. Logan. My Fair Lady, Changeling. Changeling. I like that movie. The Children's Hour. I've never seen that. The Quick and the Dead. Yeah, I don't know The Children's Hour. Mystic River, The Quick and the Dead. (laughs) It's Mystic River. Yeah, Sam Raimi was still learning how to make movies at that point. <laughs> the Saint, The Quick and the Dead. <laughs> <laughs> um, the Saint? I mean, Sharon Stone just took over that movie too much. <laughs> mm. so I'm not going to blame Sam Raimi on it. Uh, the Mexican, Lake Placid. No, the, the Mexican. Just for the movie stars alone. Yeah. Uh, Never Die Alone. Robin and Marianne or Marion or I don't recognize either any of those movies. Oh yeah, DMX. I've never seen that. Uncle Buck, Richie Rich. Uh, um, Uncle Buck, I guess. Exit through the gift shop or Enchanted. Ooh, those are two really good movies. Um, Exit through the gift shop. I've never actually seen it, so I'll go with you on that one. But I, I do like Enchanted. Tangled Vertigo. Vertigo. That's a tough one. Uh, Rocketeer Speed 2 Cruise Control. <laughs> uh, Rocketeer. <laughs> yeah. The Hobbit, The Battle of Five Armies, Horrible Bosses. Horrible Bosses. Agreed. A truly Four- Horrible Boss would make you watch The Hobbit, The Five Armies. That is true. <laughs> 42, Tommy Boy. Uh, 42. Uh, Best in Show, World War Z. Best in Show. I don't hate World War Z as much as most people do, though. Right. Halloween 2, Rocky. Rocky. (laughs) I don't need to think about that. (laughs) (laughs) Agreed. (laughs) Lady from Shanghai, Cowboys and Aliens. Lady from... And I think I lost Sean. That's the show, everybody. Talk to you next week.